morning. Why don't we all stand and praise the Lord together?
my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. Every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. And I will be.
Heavenly Father, we just give you all the praise and glory. Father, we just lift up this worship to you today. We lift up this congregation. Amen. I guess. Yes, sir. Good morning. Uh, you may be seated. Yeah, there you go. Good morning, good morning. This is, uh, this is post-Holy Week. This is the week after resurrection, so we're just going to continue celebrating, all right? Amen? Amen. Celebrating the resurrection of the Lord. We've got a, a lot planned for you and th things that are, are going to be going on. Just, I'll, I'll be right back, okay? Hang on a second. <laughs> I was charging my wife's iPad this morning. I didn't do my phone, and I, I'd be needing it. All right. Uh, thanks. I'm here. Hi. I uh, just want to share some things as we prepare our hearts for communion, you guys. I told you about a list of the names of God that I, I, I came across. Actually, I think Alex came across it, and we just started really just sharing it back and forth. I think we found it, I don't know if it was in Dakes or where we found it. But uh, man, oh man, it's just so good. And as we're going through the book of Hebrews, because as we're going through that, I want to, I'm prompted, uh, I prompted you with some things that I'm going to share with you on, on the names of God, the majesty of God. And that way, as we're going through every chapter, you can find some too and just maybe have a list, have a, a, a piece of paper next to you and just keep writing all of the majestic names of the Lord. But here's, here's just a few. As we come to the table, this is the resurrected king. This is the resurrected king. The, the, the pivotal point, if you would, the foundation, as it were, the 
uh, I mean, the, the rock bottom. I mean, we scrape all the dirt away. You've got to build on something. It's going to be on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? You give him applause. Give him applause on that one. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, we're looking at eschatology, and it's an important issue because the Bible is, is a, 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 you know, well over a third of it is just, I mean, eschatology, the study of eschatological things. And, and it's the, uh, you know, when you, when you think of the, the first line uh, of, uh, or the best line, if you would, when you're looking at eschatology, you say, when does it begin? When does the eschatology begin? You know, and a lot of us would say, well, you got to, you know, jump over to Daniel, Nehemiah, uh, look at Thessalonians, look at Matthew. I mean, we got to go through Revelation and go through that. But church, you know when it began? The, the very first line, the very first line, the very first study of eschatology is just like some other great books that we have. There are a lot of great literature out there. It was the best of days. It was the worst of days. You know, that was tell us, you know, right? The tell of two cities. Uh, how about call me Ishmael? I mean, that's a great line. How about um, where is Papa going with the axe? I'll let you figure that one out. I said, what? That's the first line of a book. But the first line, the first study, the first verse that we have of eschatology is in the beginning. It starts there. That's the beginning of study of eschatology. You have to start there. In the beginning. In the beginning. Because if there's a beginning, there is a... So it's the study of what's coming. So everything after in is a study of what's coming. So when we look at all the Bible, we cannot exclude the Old Testament from the New Testament. It's, we have to take it all in. And throughout the entire Bible, we see that he's the one who judges. He is the one who is righteous. He is the one that loves us. He is the one that made the seven stars of Oren. He is the great lights. He's the controller of the great lights that will go out for a period of time, sometime tomorrow. And this, this great, worrisome eclipse that we're going to have. And, I, man, I hope it's it. It would be, just be totally great. Come on, Lord. But I, I think there's just a lot of work still to be done. You know, when we see, when we see the, the things that he has done and things that he will do, he's giving us signs. one who has not spared his own son. Uh, he is the high and lifted up God. He's the redeemer. He's the one who led his people through the wilderness and still does, because church, this is a wilderness. Life is the wilderness that we are walking through. He is the one who walks in the midst of the golden uh, candle stands, the seven of them in Revelation. He is the one that holds all things together. He is the one whom sent the son. In him we ought not fear. He is the anointed. He is the dear son. He is the only one, the only God. He is the one of Israel. He is the house of our defense. He is the spirit of promise, the hope of Israel. He is our horn of salvation. He's the great I am. He is the one that is gracious. He is the comforter. He is the one that, that speaketh all things. He is the one that, that I am not afraid in this world because he is with me. He is the Almighty. And I can go on and on for days. We can do an entire sermon of just me reading the names of God and reading the scriptures that go therewith. Because when we're reading scripture, we need to be looking at the things that he is, the attributes of his name. That's why we come to this table. That's why we celebrate. We're celebrating the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension, and the soon return of Jesus Christ when we lift up his name and when we have communion together. I get amen on that. I don't know. I've never, I've never thoroughly enjoyed Easter like we have. It's just been amazing to us. What God has done, what he's done in the midst of us, what he's going to continue to do through us. And we need not be discouraged. We need not be fearful. Church, we may be apprehensive. We may be anxious. But please let us not become anxious for everything and praying about nothing. We need to start with prayer. For those who use and are, amen, who are those who use and are familiar with, with a Bible version on the Bible, this week has all been about all been about the armor of God, all about the armor of God, and today is, is part of the most important uh, positioning of ourselves in the armor. We can have all of the armor on, all six pieces, but we need to pray. We need to pray. We need to pray and we need to be alert. We need to be aware, but we need not fear because we have God on our side. Amen? So, amen. Lord, we come before you as we prepare our hearts for this amazing communion table that you have given to us. 
Lord, that you have taken the Passover meal and you have completed something, you have fulfilled something, you have brought something very beautiful to it, and it's you. It's the revelation of you. It's the fulfilling that you have done. It's the um, exposing of it all. And the disciples knew it far well better after the resurrection than they did before it. So, Lord, I just ask you once again that, that we would have our eyes opened up, that there would be, let no one be caught in sin remain inside the lie of the inward shame, that we would fix our eyes on the cross and we would run to him who shows us great love. He bled for us freely you have bled for us, Lord. We thank you for that. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead. We are one with him again. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Lord, prepare our hearts for communion today. Communion with you. You have defeated the enemy. You have defeated death. You have conquered and defeated sin. And in you, Christ, we can live victorious because you were victorious over it. Over it. Lord, I pray for anyone in here that does not have that relationship with you, that doesn't feel welcome at the table of the king, that today they would say, Lord, I need you. Lord, I want you. Every hour I need you. When I'm alone, I need you. When I'm awake, I need you. Lord, forgive me for my sin. Wash me and cleanse me by your blood. Deliver me from sin and death. Fill me with your spirit. Lord, I am sorry for my transgression and sin, and I ask you to forgive me. And Lord, you said, or you showed, I have. I spread out my arms for you and died on a cross and rose from the dead. And now my arms are open to you. Come to me. Come to me. Are you weary? Are you heavy laden? Are you burdened? Take my yoke upon you, says the Lord. You're welcome at the table of the king if you have received in your heart and confessed with your mouth that he is Lord and that God raised him from the dead. Please, please feel welcome at his table if you've confessed that and you believe that. In Jesus' name, amen. Those that have been asked to, to uh, usher the table of the Lord, please come forward. And if that spoke to your heart, either watching online or, or in this room, please come and see somebody afterward at either side of the sanctuary. We'll offer this uh, once again at the end of service. And if you're watching online and you've received Christ, that's awesome. I'm asking you now to run to your kitchen while this music is playing. Get yourself a cracker and, a, and some juice and join us in communion also. In Jesus' name. Everything I want 
Lord, today we are declaring our gratefulness, our thankfulness. And Lord, once again, our dependency upon you for all things, God. For all things pertaining to life and godliness, we need you. For all things pertaining to life and godliness, we have your word. And Lord, I ask you that we would be those that would take this love letter that you've written, that you've given to us, and start within the beginning and go all the way through it, burying it in our hearts, allowing it to become a lamp unto our feet, having it cause us to raise up a standard in our lives, Lord, that we would look to you, that, Lord, that we would yield to you, we would yield to your word, we would allow you and your word to perfect us. Not perfectionism, but, Lord, to complete us, to use the word complete in that. And that would be perfect us, Lord, to complete us in you. And he who began a good work in us, you, Lord, you are faithful to complete it. You are the faithful one. Any and everything that we need, Lord, is found in your word, and your, your name is there, every page. Your attributes are there, every page. Your heart is there, every page. Your character, long-suffering, your love, your joy, your patience, your kindness, your goodness, your faithfulness, Lord, your gentleness are all there. For us, God. Now, 
on the evening that the Lord was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take this, all of you. Eat of this. This is my body which is broken for you. As often as you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we remember what you have done. We remember who you are. We recognize what you are doing. And our hope is in your soon return, Lord. But Lord, may we be as faithful as Hebrews chapter 11, that we will press on, press in, and press up in you. In Jesus' name, let's take the bread together. When supper was concluding, the scriptures revealed to us that he took a cup. He took the redemption cup and he said, take this, all of you. This is the cup of the new and everlasting covenant that I'm making with you. As often as you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. And in so doing, Lord, we declare and remember your death and your burial. We know that there's the soon coming, but Lord, to remember your death and your burial. I think is there so we would remember that, what you have done, what you went through, that we might have life eternal with you. Lord, our hearts anticipate the coming, the return of you, God. Yes, with excitement. But Lord, we are included in that. We will either go individually or we'll be caught up, wrapped to, Lord, in the clouds with you. Only because of what you have done for us. You paid a debt that we could not pay. You satisfied a debt that was insurmountable for us. For you so loved the world, God, you gave your only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall have everlasting life and not perish. Glory to you, God. Glory to God in the highest. And peace on earth, good will to men. Let's take the cup together. Mm. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, good morning. If you have a cup, you want to the cups, please pass them to the center, and uh, we can have those taken out of your hands. And You guys, I've had a couple of announcements before we jump right back into the Word. Uh, we handed out a Save the Date for VBS. There's cards available to you. If there, you need some more of those, we'll have some available. But uh, there's a bunch of information. If you have neighborhood, if you live in a neighborhood that's got kids, Please stop and, and, and just invite them. Just invite those kids. Let them know what's going on. It's going to be July 22 through 26, 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. For all ages, 4 to 12. It's free, and there's a bunch of stuff that you can get involved with. Please, please, please see Heather and jump in and help. Uh, this is a, a join us in the epic adventure from Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning to the end, the Alpha, the Omega. We will sail along a fun jungle cruise stopping at 11 ports of call, the seven seas of history, the seven seas of history, creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, Christ, the cross, and the consummation. We'll deliver these three events and it will reconnect us with the Bible for every day. Prepare to swing into fun and head out on the great jungle journey. <laughs> We gonna have some fun. We always have fun. We always have fun. So mark your calendars for that and get the word out. Okay. Um, last year in October, we had a we had a, a an evening set that we were going to have a special guest speaker, a couple of them, and uh, we wound up having I don't know. There's a hundred people in here, so so we want to get the word out and fill this place up. So fill this place up, if, and it gives you enough time to mark your calendars. The uh, National Day of Prayer is coming up. It's the first Thursday in May. Say first Thursday. May. Okay. May, May, for, May the 2nd is going to be the first Thursday. Okay. So when you get to the 4th, that'll be the May the 4th be with you. But the 4th will be with us, the force of God, <laughs> every day. But we're going to celebrate that on the Capitol steps. In the morning, there's a governor's prayer breakfast. And this special guest has been invited there, as well as his, who he's, who he's with. Um, and then uh, will join us at the Capitol Steps for a time of prayer and intercession from 11 o'clock until 12. 
and then the policeman's memorial will be after that. Uh, so he's been invited over there and to see the things that are going on, and we're going to have him on that night. Thursday night, we will have him. Wednesday night, he will be, he will be here. Uh, he will be in town. Uh, he'll be at Pastor Phil's church up in Reno, Calvary Chapel, Reno Sparks, up in Reno Sparks. The man's name is David Barton. <laughs> David, come on, you got David Barton from Wall Builders. David Barton from Wall Builders. Many of you, you know, I don't know if you have it in your lap or not, but uh, the Bible that he has put out with all the references, and he, he's got the, the, the largest collection of antiques and artifacts and letters of our founding forefathers, how the country was formed. He's, a, he's an American historian. Uh, he's going he's, he, he's to be here. He's going to be at Jack Hibbs' church this month. Uh, he, he's just an amazing man. He's got a, a great testimony, but he's got a great word for us on where we see America, what, what's going on, and what we should be prepared for. Okay, so that is coming up. He'll be with Chad Conley from Faith Wins. If you want to go on the website, faithwin.either, I think it's .com or .org. It's probably .org, I think. I'm not sure. But you go on Faith Wins, or you can go on Wall Builders. Wall Builders, okay? He's out of Texas. So mark your calendars for that. It's going to be an awesome time. All right. If you need a Bible, put your hand in the air. Want to put one in your lap? The uh, lyrics that I was referring to is called uh, Christ is Risen. Christ is Risen. Beneath the weight of all of our sin. I'm going to read the second stanza. You bowed. To none of heaven's you bow to none of heaven's will. No scheme of hell, no scoffer's crown, no burden great can hold you down. In strength you reign forever. Let your church proclaim: Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead. We are one with Him again. Come awake, come awake. Come rise up from the grave. The bridge is this. I love the bridge. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, hell, where is your victory? Oh, church, come and stand in the light. The glory of God has defeated the night. Oh, sting of death, where is your sting? Oh, hell, where is your victory? Oh, church, come and stand in the light. Our God is not dead. He's alive. He's alive. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake. It's a beautiful song. Uh, I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> but I just, it goes right along with where, where we're at today. And, and you guys, like I said, there's, there's first lines of books that we can, that we can look at. And, um, and, and they just, they have so much to say. And every word, every jot, every tittle that is in the Bible is important. And, and you know, today I want you to know that uh, um, there's a lot of controversy going on in churches and, and church to church, and there's a lot of um, misconceptions. There's a lot of things being exaggerated. There's a lot of things being lied about. But church, we have the truth in your lap. If you want to know what the truth is, open up the Word of God and compare whatever you're hearing, whatever you're seeing, and what other, whatever anybody is saying to this Word. To this Word. Amen? Yeah, hook it up. You guys got to be more excited. Come on! Jeez. Oh, man. There is so much evidence. There is so much evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, there are so many things that are around that, that compete. I've been reading a couple things, trying to get some facts together and put it together. It's, you know, we, we know this is a fairly well-established fact that Jesus Christ was publicly executed in Judea in the first century A.D. under Pontius Pilate uh, by means of crucifixion. You know, we have this. Uh, he was, it was done by, by Pilate, but it was behest of, of the Jewish Sanhedrin. There is non-Christian historical accounts, Josephus and Tychicus and, and, other, and, and other writings that are out there that are, were people that were eyewitnesses to what was taking place. Uh, there is a particular lawyer. I'm going to read this to you. As, uh, as for the resurrection, there are several lines of evidence, several lines of evidence which make it a compelling case for us. In a case of uh, Judas Prudence uh, uh, prodigy, this particular lawyer, his name is Sir uh, Lionel Luckhu, L-U-C-K-H-O-O, of the Guinness Book of World Records, uh, famed for his unprecedented, listen, his unprecedented 245 consecutive defense murder trial acquittals. Consecutive, bang, bang. This guy was busy, 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 busy. And he says... 
He epitomizes Christian enthusiasm and confidence in the strength of the case of the resurrection when he wrote this. This is what he says. This epitomizes the whole thing. I have spent... I have spent more than 42 years as a defense trial lawyer appearing in many parts of the world, and I am still in active practice. I have been fortunate to secure a number of success, successes in juries. You know, I mean, 245 consecutive, that's yeah, a number of them. He didn't, he didn't brag. Uh, he let other people sing his praise. And say, and I say this, I've secured a, no, a number of these cases, and I say unequivocally, the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof, which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. Yeah, hook that up on him. I mean, this is a defense lawyer that studied it. I mean, we have books and cases, The Case for Christ with Lee Strobel. And, you know, I, I know that I'm preaching to the choir, but church, we need to be those that are super convinced of this and never shrinking back on it. The evidence is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. You know, we, we look at the, what, what people say, because they're going to say, they're going to have naysayers that are going to be out there. Well, well, things don't line up. Things aren't chronological. You know, this one agreed with that one, and that one didn't agree with this one. I want to read something else to you. In the battle of skeptics re, re, regarding Christ and his resurrection, Christians are in a no-win situation. Let me read that again. In the battle with skeptics re, regarding Christ's resurrection, Christians are in a quote-unquote no-win situation. If the resurrection accounts harmonize perfectly, if the resurrection accounts harmonize perfectly, skeptics will claim that the writers of the Gospels were conspiring together. If the resurrection accounts have differences, skeptics will claim that the Gospel is in contradiction and therefore cannot be trusted. It is our contention that the resurrection accounts can be harmonized, can, may not harmonize, but they do not conflict with one another. I mean, that was a heck of a day, yeah? Huh? I mean, you're freaked out, you're messed up, you're hope for each, your hope for security, your hope for the day is dead in a grave, and he's been beaten, he's been unrec he's unrecognizable to the human eye. I mean, all hope is lost, and then you go and you're weary and you've been crying all night, you can't eat, you can't sleep, and you're the women that go to the Did they see one angel, did they see two? The fact of the matter is they saw some, whether it was one or two, was it one lady, how, how many were there, all these things that the, a skeptic is always going to find something to be skeptical about, right? It's always going to be there. So just because things don't absolutely line up does not mean that they're not true, that they're not, there's not enough evidence. However, even if the resurrection accounts aren't perfectly in harmony, that does not make them untrustworthy. You say, there are, so they're not in harmony? Now, there's some slight differences in what people saw, what people heard, and, but it's not a contradiction. They saw something that day. They were convinced of something they saw that day. Church, these people, that one of the greatest evidences that we have, the, one of the greatest evidences in your own life is your own conversion. You're not the same. You're just not the same. Do you ever want to go back? So oh, let's go back to the good old days. I'd rather hug the Lord than hug porcelain, just saying. Oh, Lord, I promise I'm not. <laughs> I mean, the only time that I've ever come close to having a, a, a stomach upset like that, church, is, is after a really good potluck that I've overeaten. But never in the morning do I have a hangover. You know, in the morning after a potluck, i got to wear stretchy pants. But, you know, that's about the only downside. Church. Church, we need to... We need not to worry about what the skeptics are saying. What we need to do is show them a life that we're living in. You know, and as we embark on this study through Hebrews and get back to it, I just want to do some overview of it. And again, some names that we see of God, the majesty of Christ that is in the Scriptures. Verse after verse, chapter after chapter. And if we could start with the majesty of Christ in the book of Hebrews starts with this. He's the heir of all things, one through whom God has made the worlds. We see this in, in chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 2. As God is the firstborn, he is, he's, he's the uh, uh, infinite and glorious one. Go through the, these next ones. Verse 3, we, we have th uh, several things, four, four things that are there. 
He's, uh, who, is, who is the brightness of God's glory, the expressed image of the person, of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. Number four, perjurer of our sins. Number five, seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. I mean, one verse has five things in it of the majesty of Christ when we're looking for them. Just look for the majesty of Christ on every page. Verse four says this, so much better than the angels, obtaining a more excellent name. Chapter 2, verse 14, the captain of our salvation. He's the captain of our salvation. Uh, Chapter 2, verse 17, he's a merciful high priest. He's not just a high priest, he's a merciful high priest. He's a perfect high priest. See, the high priest of the day, they had sin on their lives, and, and they had to go in once a year to make some atonement, to throw some blood on, on top of the mercy seat. But we have a perfect high priest who represents us all, and he's one who knows and is acquainted with our grief. He's worthy of more glory than Moses. He's the high priest who can sympathize with our own weakness, as we see in chapter 4, verse 15. Going a couple of chapters forward of chapter 7, verse 25, able to save to the uttermost. I love that, amen? You got any uttermosts in your, in your family lineage? You got some people that are pretty much the uttermosts, right? You're looking, that ain't never going to happen. They, they so hate God. Church, if I can let, let you in on a little bit of a clue, the, somebody who's fighting the most is closer than they ever have been. They're, I mean, they're scraping tooth and nail, and the enemy's trying to keep them from making a decision. But they're close. Keep praying. Don't quit. Don't quit praying for your unsaved family members. Don't quit praying for the lost and for the broken. We need to stay busy about our Lord's business visiting the widows and the orphan, keeping ourselves from being polluted from the things of this world. But church, we need to intercede, push back the gates of hell. We need to be there for one another. Find people to pray with. Find people to, to discuss the scriptures with. We've got a couple things that we're going to be introducing to the congregation, how you can get involved with other people's lives just in the day-to-days. Just in the day-to-day stuff. You know, and how we can encourage one another while it's called today. And there's some of that even in your bulletin, how we can be involved with grief share and, and helping people through times in that. The church ladies going to visit, you know, what we do during the week to go visit. And that's just, that's just about, you know, poor, going to the uttermost. What about people that are lost and they, they, they're the uttermost? Is there some, faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we need to get it out there. He's also the mediator of a better covenant. That's the covenant that we just received through communion. He's the author and finisher of our faith. He's the, he endured the cross, despising its shame, seated at the right hand of the throne of God, the one whom we consider during times of hostility. Church, he's the one that we can look to when we're in trouble. When we're in trouble, we're like, oh, Lord, I don't know what else to do. I don't know where else to go. When we're discouraged, we can find strength in him and inspiration of Christ that we would have a willingness to persevere. Persevering is tough, man. Persevering is tough. You know, I wish I could say that I've been persevering in exercise, because I, but I haven't. I need to get back to that. I need to persevere through some of those side pains when you're walking and, and pushing on and going to that next level and finding that second wind. Church, the, we need, as a church, for revival to take place, we need a second wind. We need a new wind, a fresh wind, a fresh fire just to pour through us. And we need to not shrink back. We need to actually be more busy than we ever have before. Do you see the day coming? Do you see things falling apart? Church, when we look at America and where America's at right now, you know, everybody, oh, this is the end, this is the end. Church, we are not the center. We're not the timepiece. We're not the thing to be looking at. Israel is. What's going on over there? Be alert, be aware, be in prayer. Be alert, be aware, be in prayer. <clears throat> Amen? Be alert, be aware, be in prayer. Pray with one another. Pray without ceasing, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Pray without ceasing. Prayer is an attitude of life. It's not reciting uh, words on a page. It's being in communion with God with everything we think, do, and say. Amen? I'm fired up about it. You you know, we need to do more for the Lord. Uh, We need to, where is it? We're not discouraged. He's He's the great shepherd of the sheep. He's the great shepherd of the sheep. He's the risen king, church. He's the risen king, and resurrection matters. The resurrection matters. It, it truly matters in, 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 uh, in all that we think, do, say, and believe. It matters. The resurrection. We need to believe in our heart, confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and God raised him from the dead. This is the foundation 
of our salvation. That's who we are in him. Scriptures represent conclusively that Christ raised from the dead. And we see in the, in the Gospels, we see, we see uh, uh, through the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's all there. Let me just read some things to you, if I may. This is a, a chronological order of things that took place. This is the harmony, as it were. Christ was buried and several women watched. I mean, we know that he died on that cross, but what took place? He was, he was buried. Several, several people watched. The, the tomb was sealed and a guard was set. Three women, including Mary Magdalene, Mary, mother of James and Salome, uh, prepared spices to go to the tomb. Matthew 20, I'm not, I won't read the verses, but it's, that's, that's what came next. The angel descended from heaven, rolled back a stone, sat on it. There was an earthquake, and guards fainted, fainted. The women arrived at the tomb, and they found it empty. Mary Magdalene leaves the other women and runs back to tell the disciples. The women uh, still at the tomb saw angels, and, and they told them that the risen Christ and instructed them to go tell the disciples. The women at that point leaving to bring the news to the disciples. The guards, having roused themselves, reported the empty tomb to its authorities, who, you know, who bribed the guards to, uh, to, to uh, say that the body was stolen. We have, you know, that's in Scripture. Mary, uh, Mary, mother of James, and other women were on their way, found the disciples. We see that in Matthew 28. The women related what they had heard to the disciples. And then John, Peter and John ran to the tomb, and they found it something. They found the grave clothes. Mary Magdalene returns to the tomb. She sees angels, and then she sees Jesus. Later that same day, Jesus appears to Peter. Still on that same day, Jesus appears to Cleopas and another disciple on the road to, to Emmaus. I'm going to stop there just in the reading because I just want to you know, take an ad lib on this one. This is such a cool area of Scripture, you guys. I just listened to a sermon on it just recently, and, and this is one of my favorite areas. As a matter of fact, this is my, fir- my very first devotion that, I've, that I ever did in, in, a, in a foreign country was this particular verse. I just loved it. I was, you know, these guys are on, the, on a road to Emmaus, they're discouraged, and Jesus shows up. Why? Because Jesus shows up when you're discouraged if you call on him. As a matter of fact, Jesus is there in your discouragement even when you're not recognizing him. Pay attention to who's talking to you. Somebody sees you discouraged, man, they might be an angel unawares. Amen? It could be somebody that the Lord sent. You know, Jesus showed up. They didn't even recognize him. You know, my question on this one why are y'all going to Emmaus in the morning? It's the third day and it's morning. At least give God the benefit of the doubt to show up at the 11th hour. Just saying. I mean, he's God. He can show up anytime he wants. But they were waiting for the third day he would rise again. He's Ted's, he said that. They believed everything else he said. Why are these two? And I don't, want, I don't want to throw them under the bus because one of these days I'll have to face them and say, I heard what you preached. Why, why were they confused? Why were they despaired? Why were they downcast? Are you the only one in the area that hasn't heard? You know, they were bombed. But my question was, you know, I don't know why Jesus didn't ask him. He said, didn't he say that he was going to rise on the third day? This is the morning of the third day. Why aren't you hanging out in Jerusalem until at least the end of the day and give God full day opportunity? Full day. Well, the Lord didn't let it rest there, did he? From the beginning all the way through the, can you imagine that sermon? What was Jesus talking to them about? What was he revealing? What verses did he use? Wouldn't that be an interesting sermon to listen to? Well, I I can tell you what it is. It's from Genesis to Malachi. Go ahead and read it and see if Jesus is on every page. Because that's what Jesus was revealing to these two guys on the road to Emmaus. And they still didn't. It was like, well, listen, stranger, I know it's been a long way. and Why don't you just come and have a stay with us tonight? Oh, all right. What's mama cooking? They get in there, he breaks bread and, oh. Their eyes open up. I'm just paraphrasing Pat the story on this one. Their eyes open up when he broke the bread, and then he was gone. Yeah, then he was gone. So even in their midst of despair, and he was revealing and, and, you know, showing through prophecy. And church, it was the end of the day. And those guys didn't take, it didn't take them much, because they they were probably walking, can you imagine? You know, Two Eeyores, side by side. <laughs> Two Eeyores, and then the lion of tribe of Judah shows up unawares, unrecognizable to them. And then they sit down, and can you, they're prepared. They're going to you know, call it an evening. 
pop in a Netflix or something. I don't know what they're going to do. But they were bummed. And then Jesus reveals them. So he was, their eyes were unskilled. And they got up at that very moment and went back and went back. to inc- Why? Church, they went back into trouble. They went back into despair. They went back into danger. They went back into threat. They went back into persecution. What changes a person from one direction to another? Jesus. The blood of Jesus. The power of the risen Christ. That's what changes us. They didn't, well, we'll just go in the morning. No, they did not have, we'll go in the morning mindset. They had what we saw, what we know, what we believe, what just happened to us. We need to go and encourage those other ones. We need to go. And they went back and reported. They went back that same day. They're, they're, that evening, it says that the two disciples they met, the, you know, met the 11. Jesus appeared to the disciples. Thomas wasn't there. Then he appears to the, uh, to the 11, Thomas included. And I love that for, for those of you, like, uh, Thomas just got a bad rap, doubting Thomas. No, he was inquisitive. He was an inquiring mind. So I'm not going to be fooled. You know, and I, you know, the way, unless I put my finger into your side. It's like, hey, I, wanna, I, wanna, I want some evidence of this, man. This, is, this has been a, a really, really uh, scary weekend. You know, and here he is. Here, Thomas, check this out. My Lord and my God. Jesus appears to them all at the Sea of Galilee. Jesus appears to 500 disciples in Galilee. We see this in Corinthians. Jesus appears to the half-brother James. We see this in Corinthians. Jesus commissions the disciples in Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Jesus teaches his disciples the Scriptures and promises them the Holy Spirit. Luke and Acts. Jesus ascends into heaven. That's a chronological order. That's what all of them were seeing. That's what all of them would attest to. Did they have the exact description of everything? No, they did not. But does that make it any less true? I mean, what would be happening to each one of us? We have proof, and we have proof of what, what took place because of the account that was there. You know, church, when we're, looking, when we're looking at the things that Christ accomplished, the things that he did, the first, the first thing that we see is what I've already given to you, the dramatic change of the human life, the dramatic change of the spiritual disposition that they had. They were spiritually defeated, and Israel had been that way for a long time, under the despair, under this, the, the, this cloud of just junk, and here they were changed to the point that they ran into persecution, weren't going to run from it. They ran to it. Jesus rose from the dead. We see in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. You can go through that and read that later. There are several proofs. And like I said, the first one is they went from frightened, scared, intimidated, no courage at all, to go into the world and turn it upside down. Turn it upside down. These Christians. That's what we call These Christians are turning the world upside down. Church, we need to turn the world upside down. Amen. We're supposed to be influencers in every area of our life. All the areas of our life, having influence in those areas. Christ is going to return. He will be the one that has dominion over all things. Have dom- he already has dominion over all things. Amen. He already has that. But it's going to be revealed. It's going to be revealed. And he'll make a new heaven and he'll make a new earth. These are things that we need to be excited about. That's why it's important to read eschatology, but knowing that eschatology starts at in the beginning and reading all the things. If he, he was telling them about the beginning, this is going to happen, this is what's going to happen, this is what's going to happen, this is going to happen, all the way through, and he's never failed. Jesus never fails. God never fails us and never will. The second thing that we see, I mean, if you want to see something, say, well, you have, you have any other proof? Yeah, there's a great other proof. Paul himself is a great other proof. I mean, you know, you know, most of us, most of us guys in this room, we can identify with Peter. We're just like thick-headed and put your foot in your mouth. I mean, we wouldn't claim to be Paul, you know, but, but uh, I, I think there's a, there's a, a lot like that. Here, here, Paul, there's a dramatic change that took place in this man's life, massively so. Jesus appears to him on the road to Damascus, and what happened? What happened? I mean, change took place. What happened? Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. 
And I love how, how just 1 Corinthians just lays out, and there were chapter breaks before and scripture references that we, you know, we have those for, for finding proof. But I mean, he's teaching some things, and he's going through gifts of the Spirit and how things are being abused and, and how church life is, just needs to be. Man, can we just come to church and glorify God, please? You know, and just, hey, you know, just, you know, this is what's supposed to happen. This is how the, the gifts are supposed to be used, and this is how there's supposed to be, you know, communication in the churches. And then he just goes into 15. You know, just, he, he says, that, you know, verse 40 of chapter 14 says, let all things be done decently and in order. He's talking about, man, get some order back in the church, put Christ in the center, and quit trying to be the center. Don't draw attention to yourself, draw attention to Jesus. <clears throat> draw attention to Jesus. I'm going to say it one more time. Draw attention to Jesus. Not draw attention to the Holy Spirit. Draw attention to Jesus. The Holy Spirit reveals that. So many times we want, we want to see the evidence of what God can do, what Christ is doing, what the Holy Spirit is doing, and then we start focusing on the thing that he did instead of who he is. Focus on Christ. Preach, as Paul said, I preach Jesus in, Christ, in Jesus crucified. That's what he preached. It's like, but that's not a popular message. It's, like, it's the only message, y'all. It's the only message. Jesus Christ was crucified. He died. He was buried. He rose again from the dead. He was among us. And then he ascended where he's interceding for you right now. If you say, hey, will you pray for me? I say, I'll pray with Jesus for you. But know this, he's praying for you before I even think about praying for you. Before you even send in a text, before you even send in a prayer request to be put on the prayer chain, he's already interceding. He's already using everything that's coming into our lives for his good. Because if you're in Christ Jesus, everything that we go through is for his good. But Lord, I don't like it. It's going to be tough. Just, just, okay, just you and me, Lord. Okay, just you and me. So this is, this is a great proof. So he, moreover, brother, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you and you also received in which you stand. He's, now he's encouraging. We stop correcting him. He's, you're already standing in this. By which you are saved. You hold fast the word which I preach to you. Unless you believe in vain. Church, we, the, America is very close who have believed in vain. But that doesn't mean we, the church, are believing in vain. We don't need America to believe Christ. We may be the remnant that's left after America dies. I don't want to see it die, y'all. I'm just saying. Whatever we can do to push back that, to reclaim whatever we need. But church, it's about God's glory. It's about God's glory. I am I'm discouraged. I'm, I'm, I'm upset where things are. But church, we can't give up. Lest we've believed in vain. Oh, Church, did he raise from the dead? Can he fix America? Is he going to? Not sure. <coughs> America, I'm telling you, man. Somebody sent me something and said, if Paul was alive today, he'd be sending us a letter. <laughs> Hey, you guys are doing so good, so proud of you. You know what he'd say to America? He would say the same thing he said to the church of Galatia. What has bewitched you? What has bewitched you? What is wrong with you? Why do you think that you can finish in the flesh through science? What I began in the spirit. I took you out of a land of oppression. I took you out of a land of tyranny. Did he not create an exodus for the believer called America, the great experiment? He did. How do we think that we can finish in the flesh what he began in the spirit? Oh, foolish Americans. <laughs> we need to call on God every day and every hour. We need you, Lord. We need you. We need you. Mm. Amen. The dramatic change of Paul. How cool is that? He starts preaching to them. For I delivered to you first that which, was, which I received, that Christ, that Christ died for our sin according to the Scriptures. See what's according to? According to the Scriptures. Now this is Paul. He's talking about Jesus Christ. He says Christ, the Messiah, the Christ. All those people that I was persecuting and killing and sanctioning, you know, he was the Godfather back then. <gasps> There's a Christian, go kill him, huh? There's another one, go get that one. You know, he's just, he was Guido, man. 
according to the scriptures, that he was buried, listen, that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures. Where did Billy Graham get his stuff from here? The gospel, the cross, Jesus. Oh, man. And he was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve. And after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to this present, and some have fallen asleep. So some have died, but there's a whole bunch of them left. If you don't believe this, go find one. And say, did you see him? Yeah. Straight up saw him. In the flesh. Because some were saying he was in the spirit. He was bodily raised. Bodily raised. He defeated death and bodily rose. Proving that the sacrifice of himself was received by the Father and we are forgiven. The resurrection in the empty tomb is proof that the Father accepted the sacrifice. Man. Whew. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Seen by James and the apostles. And then... Then, last of all, was seen by me also. And then he qualifies this as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, and I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He's 15 chapters into this, and church, he's revealing his heart. I have some memories that I just don't like of who I was. But he also is the strongest preacher of I'm no longer what I was. He's the one, I am crucified with Christ, yet I live. Wow. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Now grace towards me was not in vain. His grace is not in vain. How, do, how, do, how can Paul say that? He says, because he's living. I'm not going to let his grace be in vain. Church, if we let the grace of God that he's given us be just sitting on the fence and doing nothing, then, man, it's like it was done in vain. He gave us his grace. He gave us his forgiveness. He fills us with his life for a purpose. And that's to proclaim him to those who don't know him. That's been the job all along. When he took Abraham out of the place that he knew and began the house of Israel with Abraham, he's like, I'm going to take you to a place and I'm going to surround you, put you right in the middle of a bunch of ites. All these ites that I might show myself off to be faithful. Who is that God? Wow. Man, don't you love that? I mean, these aren't stories. This is history. It's his story. His story. Take an S out. You got history. Put an S in. It's his story. It's his story. He starts the people of Israel. And he said, I'm going to through you. The stars are going to be, man, the stars got nothing on the population. I'm going to have through you. How's that going to happen? Well, I'm going to make you laugh. You and mama? Oh, they're going to laugh a little bit. You're going to have a little tiny laughter. And they had a little tiny laughter. Isaac, that's what his name means. By the grace of God, I am what I am. The grace towards me, not in vain. And I labor abundantly. I labor more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but, God, but the grace of God which was in me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preached and you so believed. I mean, as long as the word's going forth, church. Now, if Christ has, if Christ has preached... And he's been raised, if Christ has preached that he is raised from the dead, or I'm sorry, he's raised from the dead, how do some of them among you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? Paul is capitalizing on, we need to know that the resurrection is real. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but church, you need to know that when somebody comes up and tries to defy it. Well, this is what happened, that what happened. If you can't answer a question that they have, or you can't answer a doubt that they're throwing, believe me, there's an answer for it. And it's going to be Jesus, because he conquered the death and the grave that we would have proof that the death and the grave are conquered, therefore we will live. If he raised, so shall we. That's our hope. That's our hope. Listen to what else he says. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, verse 13, chapter 15, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if, in fact, the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and you're still in your sins. He's just speaking to them logically. He's like, you guys are losing your minds. You've got to remember who you are and whose you are, what happened and why he did it. Don't let this doubt creep in, because, man, that's what happens. 
the waiting causes us to wonder. And church, that's what the enemy wants. He wants that kind of wonder. Change that word wonder to wonder. I wonder what he's going to do next. No, I wonder when he's coming. I wonder what's, what's up next. I don't like watching the news, but you got to stay aware. Okay, what's happening this week? You know, I, I shared with you that meme that somebody sent me. It's got this lady, and she's, she's like, she's looking like this, and the caption is, well, looking outside my front door, seeing what chapter of Ezekiel we're in. <laughs> she's checking it out. Must, must be getting close. He's risen. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Verse 19 is super sad. If in this life only, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all, we are of all men most pitiable. I shared a story one time. It was on a, a, a dear pastor. He was in, it showed a description of what would happen if this didn't happen. What would happen? Christ didn't raise from the dead. You know, he goes and he, he's visiting a, a, a person that they're on their deathbed. And he, he has, you know, he, he, he's, he, has, he opens up his Bible and all that's there is, is the Old Testament. If Christ didn't raise, the New Testament is void. So he goes and he's trying to, well, you know, let's, let's pray and let's have some. And he knows in his head, but he opens up to get the proof and the Bible's got 39 books. Oh, all hope is lost. Christ is risen from the grave. He was born. He led a sinless life. He went to the cross as a payment, a propitiation, a satisfaction for our sin debt, my sin debt that I couldn't pay. My sin, your sin was put upon him. I've been preaching this for three weeks now, and I don't get, we can't get tired of this because this is what the world needs. You know, I've, I've, you hear, you, I'm humorous. I know I am. And, and, uh, and I, I just, it just happens in my head. You know, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, what the Lord, world needs now is Jesus, sweet Jesus. Tis so sweet, amen, to trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Him. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. I mean, I know sometimes we get tired of the old song of a church when you read the history behind such sweet melodies. Louise Steed, when she wrote that, she was in despair. She was brokenhearted. She was downcast. She was destitute in life. But the Lord was providing her needs every day, every day, every day. Why was she so bummed out? Because she was in Long Island and, and her and her husband and child. Six, seven, eight years old, I forget how old Lily is at that point. Let's go on a picnic. And they hear a scream. And the scream, there's a boy screaming. And, and Dad gets up. Mr. Steve gets up. He's like, what's going on? And he goes over. He sees a boy drowning. And he jumps in the water. And water's moving. And somehow he gets caught in it too. And the boy and the father perish. And she comes out of that, trusting in the Lord wind up moving to the mission field and serving the Lord with Lily. And in that writes, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." "'Tis so sweet." How do you do that? It's a changed life. It's a changed life. What's the proof of salvation? You! Me! Oh, there's no God, really? Go ask a whole bunch of people of what I used to be. You can ask a whole bunch of people that have walked in the Lord with me and say, he's, he's no longer what he was 15 years ago. This is, this, it, church, every day we are being perfected into the image of Christ because he who get, began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. He will complete it in you. He will complete it in each one of us. It goes on here, it's just, you know, but now Christ is risen. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since man came death, by, by man also comes the resurrection. Comes the resurrection. He goes through this and he starts teaching the effects of, of the resurrection. The glorious body that we will have. This hope that we have for eternal glory. For in Adam all died. Even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one has their own order. Christ the first fruits. After those are, are Christ. Uh, those who are Christ's at the coming. 
And then comes the end. And he delivers the kingdom of God, the Father, and he puts to an end all the rule and authority and power. Come on, Jesus. For we must, he, he must reign until he puts all enemies under his feet. Who's going to win? Jesus is going to win. We have the rest of the story, church. We have the rest of the story. We need to, believe, we need to be those that, that even in these songs that I've said this morning is this. Go to verse 50. Now then, brethren, all flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. But I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. Church, you're changed right now. But there's going to be a corruptible that puts on incorruption. There's going to be an immortal that puts on immortality. That is coming. Because why? He rose from the dead to prove it. He rose from the dead to prove it. We need to be excited about that. Easter cannot, I don't like saying Easter, Holy Week cannot end. Because every Sunday begins Holy Week. Holy Week every Sunday. Every Sunday is a big, the first day of the week is Sunday and begin your Holy Week. I love that the first day became Sunday. Because most people, lots of people, I know there's a, uh, you know, 24-7 workplaces, but most, most work are at Monday through Friday. But you start, man, Sunday's here. You know, you're always, we're always looking for Friday. No, God, come on Friday, come on Friday. No, no, come on Sunday. You don't want somebody to come too soon because you don't want Monday to begin. But I get that. But let Sunday be important. Be prepared to come Sunday. Be prepared to worship. Invite people to come to church. Invite people to hang out with you. Invite people to lunch after. Invite, invite people to take a walk with you. Invite people to take ride on your bikes together. Be, let's enjoy Christ in everything that we think, do, and say. In the risings, in the setting downs, in the lying downs, in the getting up. When we're walking, when we're talking, explaining it to our kids. We see Deuteronomy, all these instructions that we've been given. Church, we're the kids of the kingdom. Let that be, man. Take it. You know, these Jewish people, I love them. But, man, I would not walk around with a, with a leather box on my forehead just saying, I don't want to do that. You say, do you guys know what that is? Say, yes, huh? They would put, they would write scriptures and they'd put it on their, on their head and, and wrap it around there. To the world. Because <laughs> they took something and said, we need to have the, the, the word of God on the forefront of our mind. It's like, so I'm going to zip tie a Bible to my forehead? I don't need it zip tied to my forehead. I need it in my head. We need it in us. We need to have him be able to pull it out anytime he needs to. Whew. Okay, I'll, I'll just want to keep you five minutes. Oh. If I can go back to Matt Marr's song. Hey, Matt, okay, go ahead. Go back to Matt Marr's song. When he wrote this, you know, when he, when he wrote that song that I was referring to earlier. So when corruptible has put on incorruption, immortality is put on immortality, what, this will, what should be brought to pass? Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Come awake, come awake. He is risen from the grave. I know that's not in there, but that's where the, uh, the language comes from. The sting of death is in sin. The sting of death is in sin, right? And the strength of it is in the law. You're not only dead in sin, but legally you're supposed to get that. That's what you deserve. Well, I'm not getting what I deserve. I'm getting what I don't deserve. God has been gracious unto us. God has been merciful towards us. He has not given us what we do deserve, and he has given us what we don't deserve. That in and of itself changed us, church. It changed you. When that light bulb came on, it changed. Please read the story of Wesley. It's in your Bible. You were handed out when you came. Wesley struggled with this. He struggled with this even as a preacher, even as a, a young faithful man in Christ. He struggled with it. When he came, when he came upon some Moravians that were not fearful of death, they just say, like, I need to find out why you feel this way. I, they weren't fearful of death. They didn't abhor anybody. I mean, Wesley had a burr under his saddle for Indians. He had, it's like, brother, <laughs> you need to lead them to Christ. You need to love them in the love of the Lord. You don't have to like them. Is there people that you don't like? Don't want an answer. But that day, just because you don't like somebody, to mean that you got to just diss them, not have anything to do with it. Because church, a lot of times you don't like somebody because God wants to bring them in your heart and you start praying for that person. I mean, I love what Lincoln said. Lincoln said, I don't care much for that person. I must get to know him better. It's like, I don't want to spend no time with him. I ain't got time for that. I don't like this person. He irritates me or she irritates me. I must get to know them. I must get to know them. Wow. 
Isn't that, that's just a, don't I, that sounds like a Christ-like way of thinking. Death, where's your sting? Grave, where's your victory? Oh, thanks be to God, it says here in verse 57, verse 56, sting of death, sin, strength of sin, law. Listen, verse 57, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Church, it goes on, and you know, there's a translation that says this, therefore, my beloved brethren, stand firm, let nothing move you. What it says in the New King James is this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty eight. Church, whatever we do in the Lord, it's never done in vain. Whatever we do in the Lord is not done in vain. He will use it to have for his glory. So even in the small things, getting out of somebody's way. Instead of somebody being irritated because they're right on your rear end, just pull over and just wave them on, man. And when they go by and they say, you're number one, just say, okay, thank you. Lord bless you. Hope you don't stub that finger in, a, in the door on the way out. But I just, you know, we, we live in such an agitated, uh, agitated world. It's on edge, man. People are angry, they're upset, they're freaked out, they're confused, they're fearful, they're hopeless. They need to see us hopeful or full of hope. When they're telling us what we're full of, make sure it's hope. (laughs) You're full of hope. (laughs) No, I believe that Jesus rose from the grave. I believe that he ascended. I believe that he's making intercession for each one of us now. I believe that he is the great I am, and I believe he is the great I'm coming. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being the resurrection, the life, the liberty that we have in you. And Lord, I ask you, as we stand for you to praise and worship you, that Lord, we would stand for everything that you stand for. That Lord, we would find ourselves in in Psalm 1 all the time. That we would not be those that are standing, sitting, or walking in scoffers and scornful, Lord. But we would be trees of living water, planted by you, Lord, being fed and nourished by your word. That, Lord, that we wouldn't give up. We wouldn't, we wouldn't cave in. But, Lord, we would, we would get, get along with you and pray and seek your face. And, Lord, continue to push forward, be involved in the surroundings around us, be involved in areas of the church that we can, be an encouragement to one another. Lord, be involved in in the the political arena that's around us, be involved in our school systems, be involved with other parents' lives that we we, we, we may not be raising kids, but we can help them raise theirs. And, Lord, not be meddlers, but be, be instrumental witnesses to them. That, Lord, that we would be involved in, in the things that are around, the arts, the entertainments. Lord, these things that, that David, uh, uh, Brother David preached about, Lord, that there are strengths of, the, of society that are around that we need to be involved in, influencers of. And, Lord, the only way we can do it is through you, in you, to you, through you, by you, Lord Jesus, representing you. Lord, you are the King of kings. You're sitting on a throne. And, Lord, we know that all things eventually as we see them temporally, will be under your feet. Until that time, Lord, we ask you that we would be your hands and your feet, your mouthpiece, your heart, your compassion and your love, but also, Lord, your truth and your, your witness, your direction, your correction when need be, but, Lord, we would do it in love. We would do it in love. In Jesus' name. And once again, Lord, I pray for anyone in here who has committed their life to you today, that today is the first day of the best of their life. And those that are online, uh, same thing, that you would just get a hold of us. We want to get some things into your hand to take those next steps. If you need prayer today, don't leave God's house without receiving that which he's prompting you to come forward for. So the altar is place is the place that we get altered. So Lord, alter us. Continue to to transform us by the renewing of our mind through the washing of your word. In Jesus' name, and his church sit. Amen. Amen. God bless. Let's rise to our feet. He is risen. Let's do the same. Let's praise him.
face shine on you and be gracious to you and the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Have a good weekend. Have a blessed week. Amen. Amen.